All right, folks, let's get into this. This is the second big uh, perspective in the Cell Now book. It's probably one of the most popular as well. A lot of students really dig into this, especially if you're interested in maybe uh, creative writing yourself or you dislike reading a good novel uh, or anything with a good story. If you want to create that kind of content, uh, this can help you to create as well as to analyze stories. So it's a pretty good choice. Uh, for just about all applications, but it's also one of my favorites, so uh, we'll get into it here. Uh, there is some terminology, there's a few parts here and there that can be somewhat confusing, so I'll try to clear those up for you. Uh, but overall, I think you'll enjoy this. Okay, so we'll get into what we mean by the narrative perspective, the key terms, the concepts you'll need to know. Uh, what distinguishes this from that Neo-Aristotelian perspective we talked about uh, last time? Uh, we'll also talk about how you can select an appropriate text to analyze with this perspective, and then how do you actually write the uh, or do and uh, write up your analysis. Uh, so just to start off with, to kind of get the uh, uh, the ball rolling, as it were, I thought we could think about fairy tales for a minute. Uh, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, uh, you know, any number of Disney stories. And what you might not realize is that if you watch, say, uh, The Little Mermaid or Beauty and the Beast, you know, any number of those Disney versions, uh, they're often quite different than the original sor uh, source material. And so what this blogger has done here, if I can get this pulled up, uh, Bridgman, uh, Bridgman Team, I don't know if that's a person or a, a group, uh, but they have uh, looked into some of these original stories <laughs> like the Little Red Riding Hood and Peter Pan and whatnot, and drawn some different sorts of morals than you might find in the movies. Uh, for example, for Peter Pan, uh, the moral they find in that is that girls are always going to be more mature than, than boys. Uh, Little Red Riding Hood I thought was fun. Invest in good eye care. <laughs> uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, just do it. Uh, so they go on. I won't read all of these, uh, but it's it's pretty it's pretty fun. I like this one too. Cinderella. It's not what you know, but who you know. <laughs> uh, so there's just some kind of fun uh, they're having with this. But you know, it's, it's kind of a symptom uh, too of the kind of fun you could have uh, doing this type of analysis too. Sometimes you can come away with a different moral than what you might expect uh, on a casual viewing when you really start to delve into the. Uh, the artifact and start thinking about the issues that we'll talk about in this lecture here. Uh, so let's, I want to give you a chance to do a little bit of a quick and dirty analysis, if you will. So just think about that opening scene of uh, Days Gone By. It's a scene that's not in the comic book, you know, as you, as you know. Uh, it's just something they created for the episode as a way to open this show. So don't worry about the rest of the show, just this little opening bit uh, where Rick is getting the gas, and just pretend like that's its own thing, like that was all there was <laughs> from start to finish. So watch that little sequence, and then come back and just think about what do you think is the moral of this story? If this were a fairy tale you were telling to a child, you know, what would you, <laughs> what would be the moral of that story? Okay, uh, so to keep things is. You know, Cell Now has a couple of examples. I don't think they're that helpful, to be honest. I just found them more confusing. Uh, I guess he's trying to say that you can do this type of analysis even on a single panel advertisement, which, which is fine. But it makes more sense to me to think about something that does have more of a story to it than an advertisement. Uh, so I picked this example, a pretty well-known example, if you have ever read the Sunday Funnies. Sunday comics in the newspaper, but there's a Charlie Brown comic, and this is one of the most iconic, <laughs> use that word again, Charlie Brown uh, gags. I mean, you see this again and again. We got Lucy and Charlie. Uh, she does this to Charlie Brown all the time. She sets up the ball like she's holding it for him to kick it. He uh, always, for whatever reason, trusts her and <laughs> tries to kick the ball. She uh, moves it up. He goes, ah, you know, and falls down and he's pretty miserable you know like charlie brown tends to be uh, so this is the narrative i want to work with uh in this lecture for our uh for our example just because it's simple everybody 
you know, it doesn't really even have any <laughs> words in here other than "og," <laughs> uh, so it's pretty easy to follow. Uh, but nevertheless, when we really start to delve into it, I think it's pretty interesting how this uh, works as a narrative, but also mentally. All right, so a narrative analysis then, instead of thinking about logical arguments supported with uh, evidence and reasoning using those five canons, remember from Aristotle we had the invention and the organization, ethos and logos and whatnot. Uh, so we're going to focus instead on morals that are told or conveyed through storytelling. So it'll be something with characters, plot, actions. Now it doesn't have to be, uh, in general, it doesn't have to be fictional. You know, it could be something based on uh, real events. You know, there's a lot of uh, novels, for example, that are called historical novels. So they might make up some of it, but it's supposed to be, you know, based on a, a true story. And increasingly, you probably notice this if you listen to the news at all, but they're using this term narrative to talk about stuff going on politically. Uh, it's almost always in the context of, of a lie. <laughs> like, well, that's just your narrative. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of a, a weird way they're using it there. Uh, but just for our purposes, uh, well, let me uh, hold off on that. But we have a special definition of narrative that we'll be using. Okay, so what do we mean by a moral? You know, I remember as a kid, my parents would read these little stories to me uh, and to my sister. And they would, at the end of the story, there'd be a little part where they would say, and the, and the moral of that story, kids, is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> or I uh, remember, too, watching a cartoon called G.I. Joe. And at the end of G.I. Joe, there would be the, I guess, Joe or who, whatever the name of that character was, would come on and, you know, basically say this. And, you know, and, <laughs> and that's half the battle. Or knowing this, knowing is half the battle. And so here's the here's a little here's what happens here's the moral, and if you know that moral then you know uh, you're already halfway there. So that's the sort of idea, um, but the problem is it's not always going to be spelled out for you like that. So what this analysis is about is really looking at what happens in the story, who it's happening to, and trying to get at what are the values there. Um, what is this story? trying to teach us or trying to persuade us about the proper way to believe or behave. Uh, it's often quite subtle. So sometimes it's confusing. It's hard to figure that out sometimes. So we really have to do some uh, hard work uh, to try to figure out what is the moral and is it ultimately is this a good moral or a, is it immoral? You know, you know, some of these stories you, you don't want to, for example, you know, I was thinking about the, you know, I just mentioned G.I. Joe, a cartoon I watched uh, as a kid. Uh, but there's always been concern about, from the public, about the programming uh, for kids, right? Children's television programming. And they're very careful about what sort of messages are embedded in those, in those cartoons. And they, they're always, we always think about what's being censored, what you're not allowed to do. But, <laughs> you know, there's also this idea that we want to, use these programs to either teach kids useful life lessons and, and things of that sort. And so it's most people would agree, yes, you should do that. You shouldn't just let kids watch whatever uh, because some of, the, some of that stuff, they might come away with a, uh, you know, bad behavior based on these, you know, terrible things that you're letting them watch, let's say. Uh, so we sort of intuit this about kids, but uh, I guess the point of this perspective is to say that doesn't never really goes away. As you get older, you might get a little bit wiser. You have more experience. You're able to tell, well, that's that's ridiculous. You know, I would never go for that. Uh, but nevertheless, these stories that we're watching on TV or reading are having some kind of impact on us, uh, whether we know it or not. And the point here is to try to get to where we do know it and we can recognize it, and then you can choose either to accept it or reject it. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, so the moral of the story doesn't have to be direct again, and it may not even be intentional. This is what gets really weird. Uh, so the author or the people making that program might say, I did not intend for that message to be out there. You know, that's not what I intended. Doesn't matter what the author says or what the author wanted. You know, if, if it has that, if you do the analysis and say, well, you might have intended this, but really the way you set this character up and the events here, actually it has a different uh, moral uh, than what you intended it to have. Uh, so a lot of 
for example, there might be a story that's trying to make a point, uh, but then they inadvertently make the opposite point. And so I think the author, we'll talk about this more when we get to the feminism chapter, for example. Uh, but just because a story might have a character in there who's, uh, well, I think she uses the example of a Murphy Brown, which I don't know how relevant that, that is nowadays, but you might have a female character in a, in a show, let's say, and at first you think this is a strong role, strong you know female character. It seems to be uh, the moral seems to be you know sort of a empowerment sort of message. Uh, but then when you really look closer closer at what happens in the story, you find out that uh, she's really unhappy and she doesn't really get happy until she quits being a superhero and, and marries and settles down. <laughs> uh, and you so you say, well, actually they might have intended for it to be this you know sort of empowering message. But then when you really look at the story. Uh, you find that uh, the moral is actually a lot more of a traditional message, and you, know, you may or may not uh, agree with that. That's uh, just a quick example uh, off the top of my head. Uh, so critics attempting uh, attempt to identify the moral of these narratives, what is the underlying ideolo ideological message, and is it good or bad? And to be a narrative, it has to have at least two events. Uh, we'll get into what we mean by <laughs> events. But two things, uh, it has to be, these two things, these two events have to be organized by time. Uh, they have to have some kind of relationship, cause and effect between them, or among them if it's more than two. And they have to present a unified subject, or they basically have to tell a complete story. Uh, and then the, a couple other terms here we should clear up. Uh, the paradigm, it's kind of a, a wonky term, sometimes this is called a, a theoretical framework, she calls it here a conceptual framework. Uh, it's basically just a way of understanding the world, sort of some base assumptions that you uh, have in mind <laughs> when you're trying to make sense of things and, and other people, really. Uh, so the when we talked about that Aristotelian perspective last time, she says that was part of this rational world paradigm. So people are rational beings, right? We think about things and we make decisions. Uh, based on logical arguments, evidence, and reasoning. So we talked about how a character makes a speech, right? And people listen to the speech, and they, when they're listening to the speech, they think, well, that, well that, you know, that's a good point. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to uh, decide what to do based on, you know, thinking cogitated, right? Uh, so that's a rational world paradigm. Uh, but Fisher... Uh, one of the people that Sal now talks about in here, and I think Rowland, and they say, actually, that's not how people work. Uh, people aren't rational like that. That's just kind of a model. Uh, really, people are, are moved instead by narratives or, or stories. Uh, so we have all these stories that we hear, that we remember, that we're told, that, that we tell, and that's really what drives us. And that's really the core of all human communication. So it's not reason uh, but it's storytelling and I have to say this is a really compelling argument because when you a lot of the stuff you learn about in linguistics or uh, hist ancient history uh, you know if you go far enough back uh, you don't find uh, philosophers way back there you find these storytellers you know the myths uh, basically these the fairy tales and uh, you know like the, like the legends and things that's what people are using uh, you know, to decide what's proper conduct, not a sort of philosophical or a legal, uh, legalistic, you know, very rational <laughs> method. You know, it starts with those myths. And I think the goal of this perspective is to say, well, really, it never ends with, it's not like the, the mythic way goes away and we embrace rationality. Uh, instead, whether we realize it or not, we're still moved by the, uh, uh, these stories. I think there's, I mean, it sounds smart. <laughs> it sounds right to me. Uh, anyway, uh, national uh, narrative uh, rationality. Uh, so this will be when you, you hear a story, you see a story, you, you, you look at it and you decide, um, you know, what are these value-laden ideological arguments being proposed in that narrative or whatever that story is? And you'll either think uh, it's good or it's bad. So that will depend on two criteria, coherence and fidelity. So these are the two aspects, I guess, of a narrative. Uh, and if these two things check out, uh, then you'll think it's a, it's a good narrative. Or, uh, if they don't, you know, you'll be able to point out some flaws. So coherence, 
is the degree to which the story hangs together. You know, everything sort of fits, it flows. And she says, uh, it's kind of like asking how plausible is it, or I don't want to, you have to be careful with the word realistic in this context, but you know, how realistic is it? Does it seem um, too far-fetched? Uh, or does it seem somehow like it, this could happen? And so she talks a little bit in here about uh, you know, there's a lot of fantasy in science fiction, and there's all kinds of stories out there that, like Groundhog's Day, <laughs> one of my favorite movies. Uh, obviously, that could never happen. Uh, it's uh, not plausible that that would happen. You just keep waking up on the same day, you know, in Groundhog's Day. Uh, but nevertheless, it does. You, you wouldn't say that that story makes no sense, that you can't follow it, that it's just totally confusing, and you just, are, uh, you know, you get nothing out of it, uh, because it's got these other elements. In play. So let, let's talk about these briefly. Uh, so structural coherence, structural coherence, you know, again, the structure of the story, the, the plotting. Now, does the story flow in a logical way, or are there big gaps, holes in the plot? You know, suddenly stuff is happening that doesn't make any sense. You can't <laughs> piece it together. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of French movies like that, and you're just like, what in the world? What? Huh? Who? You know? <laughs> now, you might be like that with... Uh, Groundhog's Day at first, right? Uh, but eventually you figure out, oh, I get it. it. That makes sense. He's waking up every day, you know, and then, uh, then it all starts to flow. Uh, so it does make sense in that way, and it does have a beginning and a middle and, you know, and an end. And you sort of get to the point about three quarters of the way through the movie, you can sort of feel like how it's probably going to end. <laughs> and that's all very uh, satisfying. You know, it would be weird if it just stopped, you know, somewhere in the middle. And there was no sort of resolution to, to anything. Uh, you would say that lacks structural coherence. Uh, character coherence is probably that, thinking about that movie again, where it's really strong. So are the characters believable? Do they act consistently? And I think that's definitely true. I mean, if you think about Groundhog's Day, and I don't know why I'm using that example, but <laughs> it's, just, it's just such a good movie. Uh, but you see uh, Bill Murray's character in there. And I think that he definitely acts, I think part of the reason we like that movie is just, yeah, that's probably what I would be doing. You know, and it seems kind of uh, true to life, even though it's it's totally fantastic. Uh, nevertheless, you think that's probably how somebody would behave in that situation, right? It, it seems in line uh, with that. And, and consistent, I mean, you get a pretty good sense of who, I forget what the name of the character is in that movie that Bill Murray uh, portrays, but you get a good sense of him as a character, as a person. He seems almost like somebody you might know. Uh, so we'd say, yes, it's got character coherence. Um, it'd be different if, you know, suddenly in one scene, Bill Murray's acting totally out of character. And you're like, how did that just doesn't seem like what something he would do? Uh, doesn't work. And you'd say that lacks character coherence. Uh, and then material coherence. Is the story consistent with similar stories we have encountered on a similar theme? Uh, the facts haven't been altered. Uh, this one's a little bit tricky, but I see that one as being the closest to what we mean when we say something is realistic or not. Uh, she, again, uses the example of science fiction there. Uh, you know, sometimes if a science fiction story, you might have futuristic technologies that, that haven't even been invented yet. But nevertheless, if it's done well, uh, you can sort of think, well, okay, we don't have that yet, but it seems like something we probably will have, you know, 100 years from now. So it seems to be uh, plausible. You say, well, yeah, we don't have a, oh, what's some of the, like in, in Star Trek, they can travel faster than light and go to all these other planets. Or <laughs> There's a show called The Expanse, you know, where we have like a colony on Mars. Uh, so for me, when I see that show Expanse, I'm like, yeah, we don't have a colony on Mars yet. So that's not something I'm familiar with from personal experience. Uh, however, I've taken some science classes, I've read a lot of science fiction stories, and, and I just, I know that this is possible. You know, we, we, it's possible that at some point in the future we could have this Martian colony, uh, and they, you know, they have the solar panels and domes and stuff, so it all seems like it fits with a scientific uh, view. <laughs> now, now, I'm not a scientist, I don't know, somebody, a, a real scientist might watch that show and think <laughs> that just falls apart. Uh, but nevertheless, just based on what I know, it seems to be realistic. Uh, so that's this idea, the material coherence. You know, it's, is it? I just think of that one as: is it? Does it line up with the facts? Um, you know, even in a fantasy movie, 
like or fantasy show like Game of Thrones, for example. Uh, that's fantasy. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that it's never going to be. It's, it's not like a hundred years from now there will be, you know, magic. Uh, but it can still have this material coherence in, in other ways, like the way they're fighting with the swords and the type of armor they're, you know, doing and the. You know, if there was a dragon, uh, you know, maybe it would look something like that. You know, so there's ways to try to make it realistic. You know, it'd look a little strange, for example, if, uh, you know, if the dragon uh, looked totally unlike any dragon you've ever seen. <laughs> if it looked more like a giant uh, tabby, you know, a giant house cat. <laughs> you think, that's not, what is going on? Uh, that does not seem, uh, you know, it would just totally throw you out uh, of the narrative. You wouldn't be able to, to follow it. So hopefully that clears that up, coherence. Now the fidelity has more to do with the values. Uh, so you're watching these characters, you're watching these actions unfold, their behavior, and you're asking yourself, does that ring true? Does that sort of jive with the way I look at the world? Does it seem truthful? Does it seem humane? Uh, do we like this character? Do we like the hero? Uh, do we hate the villain? You know, so on and so forth. And she says... Uh, I don't know, who she, she might be quoting somebody here, but she says, to achieve this fidelity, uh, a story has to have good reasons to accept its moral. Uh, so how do we get to this? The moral of the story is blah, blah, blah. And you know, maybe the good characters have triumphed and the evil has been vanquished. Uh, so that's, let's say that was the, the moral might be you need to uh, be prepared. Uh, you know, always think about the Boy Scouts motto, right? Be, always be prepared. I see that was the moral, uh, and you want to tell a story about that that sort of reinforces this idea of always being prepared. Uh, so she says that to be successful with that, uh, you want the values embedded in the message. So we need to somehow get to this moral through what happens in the story. If the story has nothing to do with being prepared, uh, then you failed <laughs> to get there, right? Uh, the relevance of the values to the decisions made. All right, so we want to be prepared. So maybe the maybe the story is actually about a Boy Scout. Uh, let's say the Boy Scout hears there's a hurricane or whatever coming, uh, so you know that they start uh, gathering food and toilet paper and water. Who knows? <laughs> and then uh, it comes to find out at the end of the story they really needed that because they can't get access to those stores and they're able just to easily use the uh, the supplies. Uh, so you could say, well, that was relevant. Uh, they had those sequences showing this Boy Scout in the grocery store buying all up, buying uh, the food, canned food, and you know all this material, uh, and that because it plays in again to this moral, it has something to do with what we're trying to, to say. Uh, the consequences that result from adhering to or defying these values, uh, so we could make the story a little more interesting. Maybe the next door neighbor uh, is not prepared, does not take the steps, <laughs> the, uh, the Boy Scout's family does. So you could say, uh, as it turns out, the, uh, the Boy Scout family ends up having to share some of those resources with, with the neighbor who wasn't prepared. And so everybody learned a lesson that day, right? Uh, the degree to which they conform to the values of the audience. Uh, so there you'd probably, in that little story I just came up with out of nowhere, you'd probably say, that does sound like it would probably click with people. They would probably like the idea of, I mean, who doesn't like the notion of being prepared? That seems to be a good uh, value. And plus, if they did share with that neighbor who wasn't so uh, prepared, that also would show generosity and a neighborly uh, spirit. And most people would say that does conform to my values. But let's imagine the story was a little different. Let's say the, <laughs> the Boy Scouts family decided they would not share or that uh, instead they would go steal uh, things or you know who knows all kinds of evil stuff. Uh, you might say, that does not really conform to, to my values. I'm not really happy with this program. Uh, I certainly wouldn't show this to anybody <laughs> if it had that kind of moral to it. Uh, you might think it's a, a satire or a parody or something, but uh, again, probably not something that would have a lot of fidelity for you. Uh, okay, uh, so back to this idea of the structure uh, of the coher or, uh, coherence and what pieces it needs to have. And Selmau says there needs to be, again, two events. And she says there's two, really two kinds of events. Uh, the one is the active event. This is probably what you think about most of the time. So these express an action. Somebody's doing something. So again, to come back to this 
Peanuts cartoon here. We've got Lucy. She puts the football down. I'm just describing this, right? Uh, she's, you know, lifts the ball up suddenly. Poor old Charlie Brown slips and falls and falls on the ground. And uh, that's the end of the story. Uh, so you see there's a lot. Of, actually, there's quite a few active events here. You know, she puts the ball down, etc. There's at least three things that happen there. Um, and those are active events. Uh, the state of events are states or conditions. Uh, think about the emotions, you know, the, the smiles, the happy and the, it may be happy at first, <laughs> excitement, <laughs> anticipation, who knows. Uh, but clearly at the end there, you've got Charlie Brown on the ground. He looks very unhappy, I would say. So I guess you might see two state of events here. Uh, the one with Lucy looking happy in that panel. And then at the end, well, really, I'm, you might be able to say there's three because here he looks scared. So he kind of goes, if we just look at Charlie Brown alone, he looks kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe this one, just kind of uh, plain. <laughs> and he's got this fear. <laughs> he's falling. He's slipping. He's terrified, basically. And then the end where he looks really disappointed, as, as Charlie Brown should be. <laughs> He's hurt and frustrated. Uh, so you can see that there's there's really two different kinds of things, uh, the sort of emotional states uh, that you're in versus what's actually happening in terms of, of actions. Now, this is an important one, is the time. Uh, so with a comic panel, you know, and when we get to McLeod, he'll talk all about this. But it's kind of mysterious in a way, like how much time passes between these panels uh, here it looks like it's pre maybe just a few seconds in between, right? You can almost imagine this Lucy there with the ball. She puts it down, Charlie Brown. Maybe there's a scene that's not shown where he's running up and kicking. You know, we don't have that scene, so there might be a little gap there. Uh, but nevertheless, it's pretty clear that these, these are all sequential, right? This, then this, then this, then this. It flows in what we call a chronological, by-the-clock uh, pattern there. And that's um, one way to organize events. Now, it would be strange if we had no idea of how much time. Was this like years later? <laughs> was this before? Uh, what, what is the connection here? If we couldn't figure that out, uh, you would say it really lacks coherence because we can't figure out when the flow is, is happening. You say it has no flow. It's real hard to follow. Uh, now, you have to go beyond that, though. You know, just because A and B and C follow in a chronological sense, that's not really a story yet because we haven't tied these events together in any significant way. That's the causation, and that's the cause and effect. We want to say it's not just these aren't just random photos we went out and took. You know, instead, that there's um, some cause and effect happening. Uh, if, there's, if there's not, it's not really a narrative. Now, there has to be some type of causal relationship. So we get here with Charlie Brown on the ground because Lucy, uh, you know, tricks him, right? She lifts the ball up suddenly, he, he falls down. So we know he got here because of these events that we see happening in the panels. We say that's it's pretty obvious. It's easy to follow. Cause and effect, we, we, can, we can do this. Uh, whereas in some badly done stories, uh, it might not be clear at all. Or, or you might just say, how did that, how did we get here? This, huh, you know, it doesn't make sense. It, you know, I, I can't follow it. You know, of course, in real life, you know, this happens all the time, right? Things happen. There's no cause. There's no reason for it. it just, you know, people just say, that's life, right? Or that's uh, <laughs> that <was> just random. <laughs> or that doesn't uh, necessarily follow. Just because you have X, you get Y. And so this is, again, the reason people like narratives. Because we there we can have the cause and effect relationship. Things can make sense in a way that events that happen in real life just, just don't do. Uh, okay, and then finally, the unified subject. Again, a fancy way to put it. Uh, Aristotle just says, uh, you know, to be a narrative, you have to have the beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> there has to be, you have to be able to point these out. There, okay, we're at the middle, and there's the end. You can add some terms to it, like climax, denouement, and, and this sort of thing. But really, all you have to have is, is a beginning. Here's what happens at the beginning. Once upon a time, blah, blah, blah. Then this, then this, then this. And that brings us to the end of the story. Uh, you can think about it, too, as being sort of self-contained. So you say, we've only got four panels here in this Charlie or Peanuts uh, cartoon, but nevertheless, it tells a whole story, 
all right, here's the beginning of the story. This is the middle. Yeah, this might be the climax, I guess. And then there's the end. <laughs> Charlie Brown on, on the ground. Uh, we'd say this is a unified subject. We can just take this piece alone and we have a narrative. Now, if we just stopped here, I would say, or if, especially if you just stopped with this first panel, let's say you didn't have any of the rest except for this one panel with Lucy holding up the, the ball, uh, it'd be kind of difficult to say that's a unified subject, right? You wouldn't really, uh, to me, it really wouldn't be telling much of a story <laughs> at all. <laughs> it looks more like just kind of a piece of art or something. Uh, we need these other panels so we get the time element, we get the cause and effect, and we get the, the end. All of it makes sense. It hangs together well, and, and we say that's a, you know, a narrative. Okay, describing and interpreting the text. Uh, so this is what you do when you sit down to actually write up your analysis. And, and by the way, I didn't do this last time. I skipped over this, but she does the same setup here for uh, this perspective. She, she does the same thing in the Aristotelian perspective. She goes step by step by, like, what do you put in your essay? <laughs> uh, so go back if you... Uh, you know, since I skipped it, you might want to look at it yourself. It's fairly self-explanatory, but just for this time, I thought I would uh, do a do my own version just quickly to give you some examples. <clears throat> so let's say we wanted to write about this, just this one panel. And so the setting, that seems like it's out in a field somewhere, right? It's a sunny day, or at least it's daytime. <laughs> There's uh, some grass. That's really about all we have in terms of setting. Uh, I don't see other people here, so it seems to be a quiet park maybe. Uh, characters flat or round. Uh, so what this means is if it's a flat character, that means it's kind of a stereotype, very predictable. Uh, it doesn't seem, uh, you know, they always do the same stuff. Uh, versus a round character, which would be somebody more like us, right? Who gets better development, who changes over time, reacts in ways that aren't necessarily predictable. Usually more interesting characters are the round ones. Uh, you know, we, Lucy and Charlie Brown, you probably know them. From other Peanuts cartoons, but again, if we just had this one panel to go with, you know, I don't even really know what we would say <laughs> uh, about whether these are flat or round. Uh, I guess you could say they're kind of flat because Lucy and Charlie, they, they, they do the same sequence over and over again, and Charlie Brown never seems to learn his lesson. Uh, you know, on the other hand, it's somewhat unpredictable that Lucy lifts the ball up like that. You know, it's not something I would expect to see you know you'd be surprised if you saw two kids <laughs> and they did and you saw this play out in real life you'd probably be surprised by it and so you might say maybe she's a little rounder uh, than charlie brown who knows it'd be kind of fun to you could argue about that uh, the narrator doesn't really apply here uh, some stories will like a play for example might have a character come out and say i'm the narrator and you know here's let me explain what's going on here and charlie brown is a character blah 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 so they might give you some material uh, like that. But again, there's no narrator here unless you want to say Schultz is doing it just indirectly. But I would just say there's, there's not. Uh, the events, uh, we've gone over that already. Uh, causal relations, temporal relations, we've gone over those as well. Uh, there is a couple of terms she puts into the temporal relations. Uh, syntagmatic just means it's chronological or straightforward like this. Uh, paradigmatic would be using flashbacks, flash forwards. Uh, there's a movie called uh, Memento. It's, it's a classic movie where there's lots of interesting work done with the temporal relations. And you know, there's movies like Interstellar's another one. You know, what's another one? Arrival. <laughs> a lot of science fiction films love this. <laughs> Uh, but you know, at first time you watch it, you're not sure like, is this happening now? Is this a flashback to something that happened before the movie? Uh, is this in the future? Uh, so that you would say that's a paradigmatic temporal relation, uh, not the syntagmatic. Uh, the intended audience and their attitudes and values towards the, the subject. Now this one's pretty interesting in terms of peanuts because, you know, it is sort of a casual audience. These are in the Sunday funnies. Uh, you imagine, you know, I was reading peanuts as a small kid, you know, as soon as basically, you know, six, seven years old, I'd start reading these. <laughs> But somehow it's still compelling. You know, isn't Charles Schultz from uh, Minnesota? I think he's, I'm pretty sure he is. Uh, but, but anyway, 
Uh, you read Charles Schultz as an adult, and it's still kind of entertaining, but it's entertaining in a different way. I, I don't know how to describe it. It seems like it's more philosophical, you know, as you get older. You know, there's another comic called uh, Calvin and Hobbes, and it's the same way. I loved it as a kid, and now as an adult, and I see those cartoons, it's almost like it, it reads differently. Uh, but that would be something, you know, uh, I'd probably still say the intended audience maybe kids maybe adults but in any case they probably uh would look at this comic and think well lucy's kind of a jerk <laughs> poor old charlie brown you know but at the same time you're like you know this is kind of life this is we can all relate to this you know you, you try to trust people <laughs> uh you want to give people the benefit of a doubt you're, you're optimistic you know this time will be different but, man, they just let you down over and over again, and you've really only got yourself to blame, right? And you just, just look on Charlie Brown's face. You know, see, I mean, who can't relate to that? <laughs> uh, so you'd probably say we share those, uh, you know, the values in this comic uh, and the moral conveyed. You might not like it. You know, so this is, yeah, the potential implications of this. So, so is the argument being proposed here about how we should live our lives? Is it, is it good or bad? And again, there's no, you know, this is what the argument, that's why we call it an argument. Because uh, you could look at this same comic a couple different ways and come out with uh, different morals that you think it, it is teaching or different values that are uh, underlying this. And I mean, I kind of went over a few of them as I see them. Again, the being optimistic, being let down, being disappointed. Uh, but on the other hand, you're willing to give it another go. Right? You're always sort of willing to trust people even though they let you down over and over again. So I guess you could you could say, for example, the moral here is it's just futile to expect people ever to change. Uh, people are going to just keep doing the same. It's like the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. Uh, that's foolish. You know, the moral should be to wise up, Charlie Brown. You, know, you, sh you should be a little bit more suspicious, so not so trusting uh, of other people. And is that a good moral? Uh, you know, maybe so. Maybe, you know, I could say, uh, sure. Uh, especially if people have let you down time and time again, tricked you. You should be a little smarter. You know, once bitten, twice shy. That should be uh, the moral. You should not just keep going along with that. Uh, so you might say, that'd be good. You know, if everybody adopted that value and was, you know, the first time somebody tricks you, then you are lies to you, like, or Lucy does basically. You would, didn't ever trust her again. <laughs> You'd probably be better off. But on the other hand, you know, I could hear somebody else saying, "Well, but people do change, and you know, maybe the you know five hundredth time, uh, Lucy would let him kick it." Okay, uh, let's take a look at the student essay again, Alfred J. Cotton, and uh, let's look at it together. That's a good idea. Uh, so what I wanted to do. When you, when you write these essays, you, there's a couple of sources that you need to use. Uh, you need to obviously quote the artifact that you're looking at. In this case, he's looking at the, this movie, The Help. Uh, but he's also got some quotes in here basically from Cell now. You know, she cites a bunch of sources, and then he, Alfred J. Cotton III, is picking up a few of those. He's got Fisher there, you can see. He's got some quotes in here from... Uh, this Robert C. Rowland. And if you're wondering, like, where do I get those sources? You can just get them from the library. And you can look here at this page at the end of the perspective called References. And she lists the books and some articles that she used in this chapter. And you know this is you need to get a hold of some of these, and you can do that again either through the uh, the library. They can usually get you an e form e book. You might have to get the printed book, uh, or you can uh, you know look at the quotes that Cell now uses. But basically, you don't want to just you want to be quoting some of the theory so you can describe how you're using that perspective. Let me back up a little bit here so you can see the trying to get to the start of this article. Here we go. Now, so he's got a quote here about his artifact, the help. 
Uh, the Help is one of the top grossing and critically acclaimed movies of 2011. So he's describing this movie a little bit, and he's got a quote there, uh, this White Bennett piece, I guess, that talks about it being one of the most acclaimed uh, videos. And then when he starts talking about how what narrative analysis is, again, don't assume your reader has already read this book and is in this class and knows all about narrative perspective. Uh, you want to describe what you, how you understand that term. Uh, see if you can use some of the terminology. He's got uh, some quotes in here from this Fisher book about what storytelling is, what narrative is. Uh, then he breaks uh, breaks his essay into sections based on this Rowland's uh, structure, the form, the analysis. He talks about the narrative probability, the narrative fidelity that we've been talking about. Uh, so it does a pretty good job of weaving in the descriptions of the movie, uh, the help. He talks about what happens in the film and the characters in the film. Uh, but he also talks about this narrative perspective and he gives some of the theory, uh, some, some quotes uh, from those sources. Uh, so again, you can certainly get a lot from Cell now, but you need to go a little bit beyond just the textbook. See if you can get some of the articles and books that she references uh, to support your points. Okay, uh, so read that essay by Alfred again. Pay attention to who, how he's quoting and uh, describing things, the coherence, the fidelity, the, how he's using the terms, and then uh, you know, try to model some of that when you write uh, your essay. Uh, but just for now, do you agree with Alfred's analysis? Uh, he's got a certain viewpoint that he argues about this movie. Do you agree with him? Why or why not? All right, that'll do it for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please do ask a question or make a comment, and I will see you next time.